So this is Iron Designer here. Just wanted to put together a video on the subject of arc welding and how weldments could potentially fail. The source material for this video is going to be the Lincoln Company's Procedure Handbook of Arc Welding and Design and Practice, the 11th edition. And this is definitely a source book, a textbook, originally published in 1933. And the version I have is 11th edition. It was published in 1967. So I'm taking a little bit of educational material and presenting it in this video. So I just wanted to show you the inside cover of the book. It was published in 1957 and republished again in 1967 before they came out with the 12th edition. This video is just for educational purposes only. Some of the educational Snippets from the book fall under the Fair Use Act permitted by copyright and are for educational purposes only. So I just wanted to begin the lecture on inspection during and after welding and certain telltale signs will reveal considerable information to a qualified inspector after the welding is done. Some of the conditions illustrated in the following figures are again for educational purposes and the electrode used was the 6012 type electrode. Typically when I weld I use the 6013 because it's for a more novice welder. If you use the 6011 or 6012 type of electrodes for welding, you're considered more of a skilled or advanced welder. So I just wanted to talk about weld inspections first. So first of all, if you're doing welding such as they've done here on one side, it's a fillet weld on one side only, then if your current in the welding activity is too high, you have too many amps, you're going to start getting a rough surface and a bad undercut in the weld. Now, it may be hard to see, but if you reduce the current down to 325 amps, say, and you have a typical speed of 12 to 13 inches, here it's talking about per minute. That's because it's an automated machine. But a person could probably weld at least an inch per minute, you know, depending on the weld deposition. But at this current and speed, you're going to have a good surface weld. So when you're looking at a fillet weld and it's a flat surface weld, neither convex nor concave, you're going to have probably the best quality weld at these settings. Now in this case, let's say your current, electrical current is too low for the electrode and you keep all the other parameters the same, what you're going to have is you're going to have very poor penetration of the weld. So you're not going to have good slag coverage of the weld to protect the weld from oxidation. The surface may look a bit rough because you're not able to create the melt of the metal as you should. And you're going to have a very small throat, a very small weld that's not going to be penetrating very deep and it won't be very strong. 
So one of the ways that you want to do a weld inspection is by using what they call as a weld gauge. And the weld gauge can eliminate welds that are concave or convex. So if you have a concave weld, you're going to have a feeler gauge that is going to measure the depth of the cave of the weld. And it's going to tell you if the weld was done perpendicular and to what width your weld is. So you have different gauges for concave. Similar if you have convex weld. So you're going to have a gauge that's going to measure basically the height of the con convex portion of the weld. And it's going to bulge out. So you have basically excess metal deposition and it's a bit wasteful on the metal. And likewise on the concave, you may have um, penetration, but you don't have strength in the weld itself. You're just over melting the base metal and then you don't really have the full throat of the weld because of over penetration and it became concave. The ideal weld is in the bottom that is um, slightly convex, has the maximum throat on it without being very bulgy in the uh, weld. And you have equal legs vertically and horizontally and you have a good amount of penetration. You don't need a lot of penetration, but it should be penetrating enough that everything is fused together between the base plate and the vertical plate, more or less as shown in the diagram. Another indicator that you have too high of a current is you're gonna have weld spatter. So basically it's like if you're cooking food and your food is just spattering all outside of your pan, you could get the same thing when you're welding. You have too much current, it's bubbling the molten metal too much and causing the metal to spatter out of the weld and that's a sign and indication that your current is too high and your weld is not going to be strong. It may be porosity or you're going to have concave. You might even be burning the base metal away and spattering the, the base material. You might have to do a second pass to refill in and grind out the improper weld and then do a second pass on the weld. So excessive current might logically sound like, well, if a little is good, more is better, but it's counterintuitive. You need just to have the correct amount of current and neither too little and neither too much. So the next type of weld failure you can have is the undercut and I think we mentioned that before but here it's usually caused by welding current that's too high and what you can see in this image here is he has a gauge and he's measuring the depth of the weld and he can measure if there's undercut in the um, flat of the weld and you can see the undercut is here if you can see my cursor running along the bottom you see it it's sort of like it just rolls over but you could you could scratch underneath there and there's no weld until you get deeper in and here in this picture you could see the weld spatter up here there's no spatter but there's undercut but here there's both you have some porosity holes throughout here you can see it you can see the weld spatter in here and definitely you can see these little caves these undercuts like forming little caverns in here under the weld and that's very bad because you have to grind this out according to what it says here that it be chipped out or ground out and the joint re-welded so the undercut should be avoided 
and that's basically what's happening is you're you're overheating the metal and it's it's creating too much gas from the shielding material and it's basically um shooting out little weld droplets out of the weld where you want it to remain in and then those little droplets of weld that shoot out um then they spatter on the surface of your material so undercut is another form of weld failure now here this talks more about the welder's technique the operator's technique of course if you have automated weld the machine can maintain the arc gap or the arc length um, automatically by the machine so the electrode is fed automatically and you have a certain speed and you have a certain rate at which the weld is being deposited but if it's being done manually that's why I talked about the electrode 6013 as a novice electrode because it's not very picky as to the arc length in other words it won't extinguish out the arc if your arc gets too small or too large it'll continue to weld and melt and compared to some of the more skilled level electrodes and some of the more um, advanced level electrodes like the 6011 some of those electrodes might give you added strength Whereas maybe the novice level electrode, there's got to be a trade-off. So you may have a reduction in weld strength, but you can maintain more consistency to an unskilled welder and hopefully avoid some of the other issues like undercut and weld spatter and concaveness and convexness. So, you know, there's going to always have to be some sort of a trade-off. Another issue with welding and weld failures is going to be on fixturing. So you might have a fixture to guide the operator's hand or guide the operator's welding cable or electrodes with a fixture to try to maintain proximity. Um, it's going to improve quality but if you have fully automatic you know even those fixtures need to be adjusted and you have to have proper settings before you commence forward with the weld and in most cases the type of current that's being applied is going to be dc current it's the most widely used type of current for submerged arc welding or even arc welding mainly it comes as DC when you are at the point of the welding arc so now another form of failure is looking at the plate thickness and the comparable fillet weld size so those need to be paired up if you have too big of a fillet on too thin of a material you're gonna burn through the plate and that would be a weld failure so starting at quarter inch thick plate you're gonna start at 3 16 of a fillet weld size and when I talk about fillet weld size I'm talking about the length of the leg and only when you get down to plate 3 16 if you're trying to do a fillet weld with that's very thin material by the way to try to weld such a thin material with arc welding um, you get down into the 30 seconds size so a 3 16 thick plate you would need around 5 30 seconds but once you get up to quarter inch you get to 3 16 for the fillet weld size and then everything just goes up by 1 16 um, to almost till you get to around half an inch 5 8 and then maybe it kind of increases by an eighth of an inch 
so you know up to say one inch you might have up to three quarter inch fillet weld size but that's an enormous weld so those typically are going to be done in three passes you're going to have a root pass and then two passes on top of the root pass so at a certain point you cannot continue to just weld everything in one pass so for the engineers designing the welds and preventing weld failure so without getting too deep into mathematics and all that we're going to just use the rules of thumb all right because i think when you're out in the field it's always better to use a rule of thumb instead of breaking out your laptop or your calculator things like that so typically the throat even though numerically it's 0 0.707 which is the square root of 2 over 2 we don't need to worry about that that comes from like pythagoras and things like that we're going to forget about him and we're just going to assume that the throat is about 70 percent of the leg okay it's close enough 0 0.707 you see with all the weld failures and weld issues and weld imperfections that we have we really can't look at such tight decimal places in our engineering designs we've got to think high level and apply safety factor that's what we need to do so if you have 70 percent is your throat compared to your leg then what i did over here to the side is if you assume that the electrode metal strength is fifty thousand um psi strength okay fifty thousand psi so your base material should be comparable in strength also like a fifty thousand psi base material and they're chemistry properties should be similar so what they said in this book is that the maximum shear stress because many welds are under shear okay and normally you would take something like half the yield strength to compute your shear stress and all that but here in welding they have their own numbers and weld engineers have their own numbers and the textbook says that if you have a 50,000 PSI max ultimate strength of the weld rod, then you should immediately have a knockdown factor of around 3.7. And your maximum shear stress is going to be around, say, 13,600, right? The lower you bring that down, the more conservative you are. If you're designing at 13,000, PSI then you're more conservative your knockdown factor is nearer to four okay so what I'm showing with the three red arrows is first of all that number for the max shear stress then if you weld it on one side the allowable design load per inch for a 3 16 fillet remember that's for a quarter inch plate we just looked at that slide a moment ago is not more than 1800 um remember it's allowable design load so loads are not psi loads are in pounds it's a force right a load is a force so that's 1800 pound of force per inch okay and over here in my little calculations here, I put in the 13,600 and the 1,800. And I calculated the length of the throat for a 3 16 leg. The throat length would be like 0 0.132, 0 0.133, something like that. And the area per inch, you just multiply it times 1. It's the same number because any, you know, you're just multiplying by one. And when you divide that area into the, um, or multiply it against the shear stress, either way you want to do it, you get the value 1807, 1806. So they've just truncated down. They got rid of the last, um, you know, numerical figure here and just said 1800. 
okay so just keep that as a mental note that for every inch of weld on one side in bending and shear so it's like always combined loading you cannot assume only one mode of failure it's not just only shear it's not just only bending it's not just only torsion it's combinations of things if you have combinations then these loads have to be divided among all the different combined variations of your load okay so just keep this value in the back of your mind so in this slide again remember I'm trying to explain to you how welds fail okay and as a welding engineer the best thing to do is to remember rules of thumb okay just remember rules of thumb just like we said that the throat is 70 percent of the leg and for every 3 16 weld on a quarter inch plate it can hold 1800 pounds single-sided weld in bending moment and shear and if you have combined loading you divide the load among shear and among bending okay so here we go again I have this deposition rate chart and I'm zooming in down here in the corner okay because that's where we're going to reside since much of our welding is going to be hand welded with very minute amounts of automation we may have fixturing remember we talked about that in the previous slide but mostly it's hand welding fixturing and low amounts of deposition because we're using commercial rod e6013 for novice welders and over here i've zoomed it in to that corner down there and what does it say hand welding all sizes and types and also for semi-automatic dc okay and here is single electrodes moving on up but when we look here at the amps we saw that in the previous slide the recommended amps was 325 okay so we are you know rule of thumb weld engineers we're thinking 300 right so between 200 and 400 we can go up this line into this crowded field here and we go across and we see it's around 0.10 maybe 0.11 and what is it talking about it's talking about the pounds of welding material deposited per minute so let's just remember that as another rule of thumb put it in the back of our mind 0.1 pounds per minute for our hand welding at 300 amps just remember this little one single data point okay just remember it okay so here i'm gonna stretch your mind a little bit okay and i just want you to use your imagination we're gonna do some again rule of thumb um interpolation of this data table what this data table is showing is that if you do a butt weld in other words you bring two pieces of metal in together you grind some corners off so that weld can go into the grinded off corners and you're gonna butt those two pieces of metal together now over here it tells you that this this thickness of this plate is say three quarters of an inch thick I'm just doing this row as an example all right for a three quarters of an inch thick plate doing a butt weld which is like this is called a double V basically you want 900 amps and you're like whoa that is way higher than what iron designer talked to us about so remember you are down in the quarter inch thick plate so if you are one third of that because you're at three quarter so you go down to a third you're at 
one quarter, right? One quarter plus one quarter plus one quarter is three quarter. So you want a third of the amps and it would be 300 amps. The volt seems to stay the same. Maybe it might go down to 30 or 28, 29 volts. You know, if you just do a linear interpretation on down, it doesn't look like it's got such a great slope. And then here you go. Your speed in inches per minute is going to be around a third of that, you know, but for hand welding, you know, one to two inches per minute. Okay. Now this is the, this is the important part. The weld wire size, 730 seconds. Well, how big is that? Well, I did this little table for you right here. You see 730 seconds would be 0.218, around 0.219, close to 0.22, all right? So it's getting thick. It's almost like a quarter of an inch, right, 0.22? Well, when we're doing hand welding, our weld rod is only one-eighth of an inch diameter, okay? So their weld wire is huge. Our welding rod is pretty thin. So when you see a table like that, you know, don't just look at the values. Try to do interpolation of the values and bring it down to where you believe you as the weld engineer that's trying to avoid weld failures is going, you know, try to work it out so that you bring it down to the level where you think you're going to be at. You're going to use interpolation and you're going to do some approximation and rule of thumb, okay? Remember, rules of thumb work out really well. They get you in the ballpark. Okay, now here is the next slide that you need to interpret as a weld engineer that is avoiding weld failure. What they're talking about here is the same butt weld, but what they're doing is they're putting in this plate called the backer plate, all right? Sometimes the backer plates just stay with the weld mint. They never take them out because the root of the weld down here actually melts the backer plate, and then the backer plate just stays along for the ride with the weld mint. But here's the issue. Here's the backer bar. If you have a quarter of an inch thick backer bar, right this is the backer bar talking about they're running 900 amps 33 volts remember in the previous slide we we said well what about 300 amps but what you need to look at is who look at this speed of the inches per minute these guys are flying down that weld gap 26 inches per minute that's more than two feet per minute which is between 13 and 24 times faster than manual welding all right and they're using enormous weld rods from 3 16 all the way to 7 30 seconds remember we said that was almost like 0.22 diameter okay and so when you look at the steel backer bar, you could probably go with a thinner backer bar, like a 16 gauge backer bar, and you're getting down into the ranges that we were talking about before. If you have just a thin back bar and you're bringing your amps down to, our rule of thumb was 300 amps, maybe 27, 28 volts, okay? And we're lowering down our um velocity of the weld here i can't believe the speed 100 to 120 inches per minute okay with an eighth of an inch weld wire so this is what automation can do but we need to take automation values and convert them into hand welding concepts and hand welding values Now this slide, I just wanted to put it in here so you have something to think about. 
what they're talking about here is very thin gauge material so this material is very thin and they're coming along and they're welding the seam they're still calling it a butt weld because the two parts are laying flat together against the edge and I don't want to get too much into this um, this slide but what it shows you basically is if you're welding in the flat position if you're welding in the vertical position so you're going up you see how they're pulling this way so imagine your welding rod is going upward okay you start at the bottom and you're piling on weld okay and I think this one they're welding toward us all right but you can look at the rod that they're using is the advanced 6011 rod and if you're here an eighth of an inch diameter with the advanced rod then you're in these ranges from 16 gauge you can even go all the way up to 10 gauge okay and I'll let you guys just look at the amps on your own the arc speed in inches per minute is again flying they're getting up to 30 inches per minute and you know the arc speed in feet per hour at 100% operating factor so these guys can really fly pretty fast and the important part here is look at their pounds of electrode per foot of weld okay so they were talking previously in the slide about remember 0 0.10 0 0.11 um, pounds per minute that they were dropping down in the previous slide and here they're talking about with the E6011 at at 0 0.02 um, you know on average here 0 0.02 pounds of electrode per foot of weld so in every foot of weld the the pound of electrode deposited is 0 0.026 and you could keep that as a rule of thumb. That might be a hard value just to memorize. But, you know, everything else is kind of in that range. If you're having a discussion with someone, even at 10 gauge material, 0 0.055 pounds of electrode per foot of weld. So this slide here, I'm not going to get into it very much, but I'm just showing you that here they're doing fillet welds with sheet metal. So they still have sheet around the same gauges we looked at previously when they did the butt welding, whether vertically or horizontally. So here they're doing a fillet weld in a vertical position with sheet metal. Okay, very interesting. And here, they're doing horizontal welding, fillet welds with sheet metal. They're capturing it either in a V, all right, or perpendicular on the table. So this is in the flat position. This is in the vertical position. And they're welding in this direction in the fillet, okay? I just thought I'd put it up there because it is interesting you can look at these values here on your own. You can maybe do a screenshot if you want of this part of the video. And you can look at the, the current. Remember, we're always in the 300 amps or so, right? And we're going about one to two inches per minute manually. Here, what they've done is drop their amps way down the reason is they don't want spatter right they don't want to burn through they don't want to undercut so this is how you prevent weld failures okay and you could look at the pounds per foot it's a little bit higher when you're doing this kind of welding you know here before it was 0 0.055 on 10 gauge 
now it's 0 0.068 so you're depositing even more metal into your fillet welds when you're doing these kinds of welding so this chart is basically showing sheet metal again you can tell by looking at the gauge because they're marking it in gauge and not fractional and since we've been using 10 gauge for a lot of our previous examples so this would be 10 gauge thick material and they're calling it backing 80 to 100 percent penetration so basically they're going to melt this corner um into a weld and they seem to put some kind of uh maybe layered um backers here but look at the amps it's double what we normally talk about look at the volts it's still in that same range of maybe you know 25 to 35 volts something like that so volts is, seems to be maintained but the reason why their amps is doubled because look at the speed they are flying across that corner at 80 to 100 inches per minute that is just like like five feet six feet seven feet per minute you know look at some of these values they are just literally flying through that corner to weld it up into a corner weld a flush corner weld and here we go at the wire size similar to what we normally talk about but they need such a large wire size like a 1 8 inch it's not as large as 7 30 seconds but it's still pretty good size and it's the size of our welding rods that we use for shielded metal arc for manual welding we use the eighth inch they're using a wire we're using an electrode but they are literally flying across that corner just thought you would want to look at this slide so this diagram is very interesting it's again looking at corner welds thicker material there's our quarter inch look at the huge amount of amps and what this is called it's called half open so what they do is they bring this plate only halfway across this plate the other one was all the way they called that flush okay here they call this half open so the electrode is going to deposit weld into here and weld it about 80% to 100% penetration, which means getting all the way down from 80% down to all the way down to the backing. Now, sometimes these backing corners might actually be ceramic, so they're not going to melt into the metal and they're not going to go along with the backer bar. They might be just ceramic plates that are going to catch the melt but the melt's not going to stick to the ceramic okay so look at the 700 amps the volts again is in that 30 range say plus or minus four and the speed is slowing down a little bit because you've got thicker plates more heat is required more energy is required that's why they've got the 700 amps and their speed has slowed down so they're no longer flying across at 80 to 100 inches per minute now they're down to 56 inches per minute which like a little bit more than four feet per minute which is still absolutely flying and they're back to the very large electrodes or the large wires and i just wanted to show you this slide really quick so I just wanted to show you this slide. It talks about lap welds. And the lap weld is obvious like when this plate laps over this plate and they want to weld a fillet in this lap. So a little bit of a hybrid, not quite a fillet, not quite a butt weld, kind of this hybrid um, connection. And what they're doing here their recommendation is if these plates are quarter of an inch your amps 
are now coming down, right, getting closer to the range where we do in hand welding, manual welding, fixture welding, jig welding, but it's not automation. The volts coming down, the speed at which they're welding is coming down, the welding wire size is coming down, and the leg size is similar to where we similar to where we want to design around the 316 size so nothing here to really remember just that when you're in plate thicknesses it looks like amps and volts and speeds start to slow down okay okay so now we're getting into some engineering here and I know you engineers are going to love this slide. And over here is my calcs and my diagram. So what this little slide is talking about is you've got three examples here. You've got a good weld. Everything is equal. And it's slightly convex, right? It's just slightly. And here's your weld throat. It's one-sided. And here's um, a bad welder. He did a convex weld, and he's going to come up to the engineer and say, Hey, Mr. Engineer, look at this. I did a convex weld just like you told me to do, but, you know, it's um, it just slumped a little bit. It's not a big deal because the throat is still the same as your perfect weld over here, but he's wasting weld material right here. So he's not very efficient, okay? That's on the long leg right here. And here's the short leg. Then the next day, the welder comes and says, Hey, Mr. Weld Engineer, look, I today I did um, a concave weld for you. And I'm not wasting material, you know, because you yelled at me yesterday. And um, the throat is right here, you know, and... What do you think about that, Mr. Engineer? And so you have basically an effective size of the weld. Because remember, if you penetrate too far away from the joint, then this is not effective material right here, okay? Just like this, it's not effective. It's not undercut and it's not splatter, but it's material wasted and it's um, concave. So let's take a look at these values here. How do you compute the throat on an uneven weld? So here it's even. That's easy. It's just right here's my table. And over here, these two values here, I'll even color them a different color slightly, like orange. Here you have equal leg. So I'll just show you two examples. In one case, it's like a 3 16 um, weld and in the other case it's a quarter inch weld and they're even nice even simple Pythagoras you can compute the um, the throat just very simply um, I mean the hypotenuse is across here you just use square root you square that you add it to that squared you take the square root, you get the hypotenuse, right, across here. And the throat, we just plug in our 70% rule of thumb. We have that. There's the formula, 0 0.707, which is really square root of 2 over 2 from Pythagorean theorem, times any one of the legs, and you get the, the throat, right? But over here now, how do you get the throat here? These are un, unequal legs. So you just assume that you have a triangle, a fillet weld, but the legs are not equal. So A and B are not equal, okay? So in this case, you have a combined A is quarter of an inch tall and B is 3 16 long, okay? So unequal leg. You still want to compute the effective throat S, okay? So S here, in that case, is computed like this. You take A times B divided by H, okay? 
so here you have 14, 15, 16 on O, column O, right? So here's 14, 15, 16, and you get the throat for un, unequal leg. I just did another example here. If this was like 0 0.32 and this was quarter, your, um, your throat length would be 0.917. And just to show you that the formula is working. I'm going to change this back to 0.25. And now it's just the same as an equal leg weld. See all the numbers match all their cross. And then that matches basically that. You know, I mean, there is some rounding error because I'm, you know, truncating this and chopping off some other numbers. But you can see, I mean, you're not going to go out to the fifth decimal place. Most engineers in welding just go out to like two decimal places, maybe three, but safety factor, you know, you'd go out to two. All right. So I'll put that back to 0.32. And I wanted to just go over the mathematics of throat of uneven leg and the altitude of the throat. All right. Because this is like a triangle and as one leg gets longer, the throat is going to increase, right? So that's why here, when you have unequal leg compared to this one, that's why this throat is bigger and longer and taller than that throat, okay? That's all that this slide talks about. So this slide is a little too complicated to really go through the entire slide. I'm just gonna go through one row what they're talking about here is welding overhead above your head and creating a fillet. Um, they're calling it here a weave. So you're weaving back and forth from one plate to another. You're weaving back and forth as you're pushing the melt um, down, the, down the fillet corner. Okay. Here it's showing you two passes. All right. So, you know, on pass one and pass two is a weaving pass where you're weaving from here to the other side and back and back and forth. Okay. Now this, this slide is basically talking about automation again, robotics, automation, but we're just going to look at our, um, anyway, this is the electro they're using the 6010. We're going to go back to our little friend quarter inch thick plate that we've been using in the whole video. The weld size is 3 16 It's a single pass. So we're only looking at one pass bead all the way down. The electrode size is huge. It's 3 16 Remember in hand welding, we're just using eighth inch. The current is way down, which is very interesting. Here the electrode melt off rate. So you're eating up eight and a quarter inches of weld rod per minute. This is going to be very interesting when we look at calculations toward the end of the video. Here the arc speed. So how fast you are flying down the corner is seven inches per minute, which is, I think, pretty fast to weld that fast. But they're also melting off from 3 16 rod, you can compute the volume, 3 16 compute the area times the distance, times the density is gonna give you the pounds of electrode. You, you should verify that number. They're doing one pass and here is the feet of joint welded per hour is around 35 feet of joint welded per hour. That is huge. You know, that, that's like the, the length of a building. You know, it's huge. And here's the pounds of electrode per foot. So you can, on your own, compute 3 16 electrode diameter, eight and, a half, eight and a quarter inches per minute, okay? And compute um, at this arc speed of seven inches per minute on the pass. So this is melt rate, speed of the arc, and compute if that adds up to 0.14, all right? Usually for metal density or steel density, I use 
0 0.283 pounds per cubic inch is the density of steel that I use. So in this slide, it's similar to the previous slide, I tried actually to replicate some of their numbers in the rows, like here I tried like row one, two, and three. So row one, I believe is saying that it's um, a 3 16 thick plate with a 5 32nd weld and a 5 32nd electrode size and it's got like a nine and a half inch per minute melt rate for the electrode and 10 inches per minute on the first pass and you're supposed to get 0 0.08 pounds of electrode per foot of weld and I only get that if I take this um, previous value and I multiply it by um, 12 um, divided by the um, rod melt speed because it's nine and a half inches per minute. So, you know, you have to ratio it up to 12 inches per minute to try to get the, um, try to get the um, same values in feet. And then row two, I had to do the same thing. I was able to get to 14. So it's like there seems to be this error in the table where they're taking their um, rod melt, melt off rate and it looks like they're multiplying it by 12 over um, the rod the rod melt rate. But then when you get down here in row three for the 5 16 plate with the quarter inch weld, um, you, you just simply get the 0 0.17, which is what I got, uh, without ratioing it up. But if you ratio it up, you get 0.24. So you guys take a look at this table. If you want to also calculate it out and create your own spreadsheet to calculate it out. But th my, my whole point is that as a welding engineer, don't just take the values directly from a textbook either. No matter what, you have to apply like a sanity check to everything and you need to scrutinize every value even in a table, even in a book. For example, this book's been published 10 times because I have the 11th edition and in 10 or 11 publications, nobody has ever questioned some of these values, you know, and, you know, nobody's even just tested to see if these numbers make sense. So I don't know. I could be making a mistake. Please comment down below in the video if you feel that I have created an error, but these are my numbers here and what this is I'm just I thought maybe I was I was making the mistake that I need to calculate the volume of the fillet instead of the volume of the welding rod and it also didn't really um, change anything so these are my values here because um, I thought maybe what they're talking about is pounds of electrode per foot of weld when they're talking about the fillet weld and that didn't really come out. So it is maybe talking about pounds of electrode, not pounds of fillet weld. But, you know, this is basically just talking about um, welding vertically. So remember, this would be a flush joint, right? It's not a half, a half lap flush, you know, like we saw before. So you always have to make sure, you know, are you talking about you know, an inner fillet weld, an external, you know, half lap joint. Um, and always double check the numbers. Don't just take anything in a, in a table for granted. You know, that's another way that welds fail is that the engineer will say, yeah, well, I just grabbed this number out of the book, you know. I mean, it's from Lincoln Arc Welding. They're a major company and supplier of welding you know um, machinery and things and I didn't know that you know I should have double checked the value but you know by then it's too late because the building has already 
collapsed or you know the the engine has you know fried so please do your due diligence and double check all your numbers and verify and validate you know textbooks there's tons of edit editing mistakes in textbooks and back in those days in the 60s when they wrote this book or even in the 30s they did their calculations by hand and when the person was printing these books in the old-fashioned printing machines you know they might have put in there the wrong numbers maybe the the writing was scribbled or illegible and then he put the wrong values in there nobody went through this book's almost like a thousand pages long and nobody went through to double check each and every single number and value so now you need to do it you're the weld engineer you've got to validate and verify all these numbers and go over it two or three times look at it from different angle different points of view different concepts you know have multiple ways to find the same numbers and the same conclusion and if you find an error then you know you're kind of on your own you need to determine now as the welding engineer what is the real value that you need to put in your design and you can back that up mathematically okay so in this slide it's similar to the other v slide i showed you when they're doing the sheet metal welding but here they're doing actual plate even though they've gone down to um you know thinner thinner plates but they have from extremely small leg sizes down to one eighth of an inch leg which is very small probably very difficult to weld but again we're just looking at our quarter inch or three sixteenths um, leg and you look at the amps the volts the welding speed of the electrode arc and the wire size and I just kind of out here off to the side because it was kind of blurry I just wrote it down you know so you have an idea of what the wire sizes are in the table if it's hard to read in the video here in this slide you basically see the same information like we've looked at before but here they're using uh, fillet welds on both sides so basically you've got your plate thicknesses and they're repeating the amps the volts the speed in inches per minute it's a it's a little bit of a duplication from other slides so in this slide it's for the design engineer so if the weld engineer is also doing the weld design what they're saying here is just another rule of thumb that if you have transverse loading here that you can assume that it's 30 percent stronger than if it's loaded parallel so this would be parallel to the direction of the weld and this is they're calling this transverse to the direction of the weld and that in this situation uh, you can assume it's 30 percent stronger but personally I wouldn't I would um, use the most conservative approach and I would go back to that table we saw earlier with the knockdown factors and I would apply remember we had 1800 pound load per inch I wouldn't vary from that I would just not multiply that times 1.3 I would just leave it at 1800 whether it's parallel or transverse because you don't really know if there's going to be any combined loading effects that you haven't considered in your analysis and you don't want to undersize your welds and cause your weld to fail because you've made a transverse loading assumption when you should have let it as parallel loading or combined loading without any alteration 
So in this slide, this is a very important slide because it could add extra weight to your weld mint and sometimes you need to calculate how much um, the weight of the weld metal is because that's going to tell you the amount of weld wire or the number of electrodes that you need to accomplish that weight in weld metal and the table is very straightforward that say if you have remember you have a quarter of an inch plate and maybe your depth or your fillet is 3 16 and you have say a 3 16 by 3 16 um, weld then the amount of weight of weld metal in pounds per foot would be 0.119 if you are a quarter by a quarter then your weight of weld metal or what I call the WWM is going to be 0.212 okay for the pounds per foot of your fillet weld that you've added um, above and beyond just the weight of the plate now you have some additional weight of the weld so that's a very simple chart. So in this slide, and I think this is one of the most important slides in the whole uh, design handbook, but what I've done here, this is basically a slide talking about the weight of the weld metal in pounds per foot. And off to the side here, I wanted to verify the the chart which I did I went to two inch and I think beyond two inch because once I was satisfied that my formulas were coming in with somewhat accuracy and matching the books values that's why I'm not really too sure about the previous slides if I'm making a, a mistake or an error maybe somebody can comment down below in the video but over here it looks like a pretty good matchup so I, I just did a few samples with the red line so I did our favorite plate which is the quarter inch um, weld quarter inch plate um, right here 0.25 with the D 10% so because they talk about the leg size here is increased by 10% for these um, chart tables here so I try to replicate some of these numbers here so at the quarter inch we're not really welding these we're, we're just doing the fillet right the equal leg fillet and I was able to get the weight of the weld material exactly 0 0.106 just like shown here at the 45 degree fillet 0.106 and then here in the flat with the um with the leg size increased by 10 percent they had a 0.129 i had a 1.128 so and there's my formula right there it shows the q10 which is the leg and um i times it by 1.1 to give it a 10 percent increase squared it multiplied it times 12 because I'm trying to make a square then I try to get the volume then I multiply by the density and then I divide by 2 that gives me the the triangle shape okay so I got that I copy the same down here for 3 8 and I got the 239 right here which is matching this under the 45 degrees and then to the right with the 10 percent increase in leg perfect match with the three quarter inch weld um, probably for like a one inch plate or don't really know but we're just talking about um, the weld metal you get a 0.956 right here I got 955 maybe there's some rounding error and then here rounding if I rounded this up it would be 1.16 just like that so if I took that and just did a roundup, there you go. 
but I'm going to leave it three decimal place. So, like I said in the previous slide, you need to double check your values, even if it's in a textbook. Please don't ever assume that a table is 100% accurate, even if it's like the 10th or 11th edition, you need to go do sanity check and verify your answers. Make sure that that you as the engineer have convinced yourself that your calculations are actually mathematically accurate. Now this one here, the convex, you know, you'd have to apply some geometry or something to this in order to compute that value. I mean, obviously the flat is easy to calculate trigonometrically, right? And But the convex, you need some geometry. And here, you'd need some like maybe parabola or something equation to do the concave. So I, I'm not doing that in this video. I'm just trying to do the, the flat with 10% or just the flat mathematically correct so um, that's really it for this slide and the last thing I want to go over here is just creating these little calculations for things like the rod calculation section right here um, similar to what was done in the table but you know i am trying to like always double check my values so what this does is um say for 21 rods of eighth inch welding rod and th this is basically what a welding rod looks like that we've been talking about in this whole video it's it's a a rod of metal covered in some kind of like a potassium cellulose covering that basically evaporates when you're welding it and shields the weld uh, so the weld doesn't get contaminated uh, from oxygen and oxidize and corrode before it has a chance to reach room temperature so that's the purpose of the shielding and the section below is the welding section and what I've done for the example here is welded um, say 28 um, rebars on the end so I'm welding a rebar to a flat plate and um, the example I'm showing here is just duplicating some of those pictures that we looked at originally from the weld quality and the weld inspection slides where it just has one fillet weld with the load um, opposing it it could either be parallel or transverse I'm assuming that the direction is now um, in a bending moment so it's bending this plate about the weld and the other side is unsupported so these are just some diagrams and calculations of the fillet welds and here's the um, equal leg, but this does compute unequal leg as well. So if uh, this was unequal, I'm calculating the hypotenuse. And you remember, it's the leg one times leg two divided by the hypotenuse is the altitude of the throat. That's the formula we saw in the earlier slide. And here's that 50,000 um, PSI that you saw before in the calculation. You saw this knockdown factor in the previous slide. And there's the 1,800 pound per unit length, which is an inch. And um, the welder welding rate is in here because I'm trying to compute the welding speed manually of the rebar rods to the plate and it comes out to um, say in this example 66.3 um, inches and it's also minutes because I'm doing uh, a certain 
weld rate per minute here and then it's telling me that in order to complete the job um, this assignment would be 44 minutes for the welder and so ultimately at you know to avoid weld failure you need to do a little bit of project management as well and compute um, welding times and do a, like a time study of minutes and you know how many uh, minutes and, and hours it's going to take and how many days um, it's going to take to accomplish this is like a eight hour day um, to accomplish a certain number of bundles of rods and so that's basically an analysis here to prevent weld failure so I hope you enjoyed it this is the conclusion of the video and this is Iron Designer saying I